Welcome along to Basketball Edition number 23. Today we're joined by myself and Phil, and we've got a very special guest, the man, the legend, Dylan Boucher. Welcome along, Dylan. Great to be here, guys. Phil, awesome, welcome man. along as always, my friend. Cheers, mate. It's, um, I'm looking forward to this one. Thanks for coming along, Dylan. I'm uh, excited to chat some MJ. Absolutely. You and I both. So today, premise of the episode, we're going to be going through four quarters, talking MJ with Dylan. And basically talking about this amazing superstar's career. So, quarter one. Dylan, first and foremost, mate, why is MJ your favorite player of all time? What got you into him? Yeah, I think for me, it was, um, it started with the Come Fly With Me video. Um, when I say video, it literally was a video. Um, <laughs> and I remember my dad sourced it somehow from the US and it came in the old format. We were, we were in the format of PAL and the video was an NTSC. So it took us some time to find an NTSC player. Um, and then watching that, that's what made me fall in love with basketball. And, you know, since that moment of watching Jordan, um, with his highlights and, and his story just inspired me to, to want to be great at basketball. In New Zealand, we, we didn't really get a heck of a lot of NBA coming through, um, onto our, onto our screens. I know as a kid, I didn't get, I didn't get a lot. So, uh, like ha- how often did you actually get a chance to, to watch Jordan or, or, you know, to really sort of, I guess, develop a, um, that sort of fan favoritism with him? You know, for me, it was magazines as a, as a wee kid, but yeah, what about yourself? Yeah. Um, like I say, we never, never got to see a lot of games, but saw a lot of highlights and obviously there was no YouTube in those days. So it literally was. Um, my dad somehow was managing to source videos and stuff from the U S and because we had a, ended up having an NTSC player, um, we were able to watch these videos. So he would, he would buy these videos somehow and, and we would get them and, and watch Jordan. And I can remember trying to, you know, I've got two older brothers and we'd watch it and we'd go out in the backyard and try and emulate all the moves that he'd done and, and the videos. So, um, again, came nowhere close to doing what he was doing but as a kid that's what inspired us to train harder to to be like mike just to follow up to the younger listeners out there i'm definitely one of them uh, vhs was the first uh, piece of technology prior to a dvd player that we had in our household so in nts could you explain briefly what that is so uh, it was a VHS, but so the, the system we used on this side of the world was as a PAL or PAL system. Um, but in the States, they used a system called NTSC. So it was recorded in a different format. So uh, back in those days, all New Zealand um, video players, I think that you could play, only played the PAL system. So you had to try and source a video player that played the NTSC system, which is the American system. So right. essentially what it was, was that anything you got from the States, you couldn't play on a regular New Zealand video player. So, um, so for us, we were fortunate. And again, I don't know how my dad got a hold of these videos, but then B, how we managed to find a player that was able to play them. And that's part of basketball edition. Not only are we about basketball, we're about educating the public. Leads me into our next question out there, Dylan, is with the gear um, with MJ, what was your, your first bit of kit that you got of the Bulls? Yeah, I think so. Again, early on, I was a huge Bulls fan, and that was purely because of Michael Jordan. And obviously, watching them win championships was pretty special. But my first, um, my first, just to make you laugh, my first piece of uh, Chicago Bulls memorabilia was a knitted Bulls jersey. Like it was, <laughs> it was. It was something that uh, we went on a family holiday to the States and um, there was a Chicago Bulls jersey that was like a knitted jersey. And I <laughs> that jersey. It was, it was something crazy. Um, but yeah, that was my first piece. And then I started obviously buying Jordan shoes and uh, that's when the, uh, I guess it all started for me. And what was your first Jordan shoe that you scored? Uh, I think they were, like, they were like a Jordan 6 or something like that. They were like a... a a pair that's not even popular at all now, and and they were they weren't that good looking, but it was one of the all I could afford at the time, and so I managed to purchase a pair of those and and thrash them till they were till they were completely worn out. But now I'll happily say with a little bit more money by my side, I uh, able to buy some some better ones. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jimmy and I talk about uh, in the nineties, uh, good old farmers. There were about four different teams that were available. Um, to us to purchase, there was the LA Lakers, Chicago Bulls, 
the Charlotte Hornets and Orlando Magic. So uh, getting along to farmers and Decker, um, that was always a, that was a, a hot spot to to get our gear because I think I think I had a yeah a, it wasn't a Jordan jersey but it was a yeah um, a, a Chicago Bulls jersey that was that was probably one of my favorite items as well as I mean Shaq's the reason I like basketball unlike yourself with MJ sort of moving on from from the kit any sort of insights or lessons that you learned watching Jordan I we'll sort of we'll probably we we might get into a little bit later but Jordan was so unique in the fact that. Not only was he a scoring champion, he was also a defensive champion as well. One of the only players to win the scoring title and the defensive title in the same year. Yeah, I mean, I think what was unique with Jordan is, um, I think what separated him, not only was he, you know, probably in his day more athletic than your average. Um, there was a few guys like your Dominique Wilkins of the world, your Sean Kemp's around that era that were probably more athletic than Jordan. But Jordan was able to just have such control in the air with his athleticism and you watch the NBA now and most of the players play like that, you know, play above the rim and, and have the probably supreme athleticism to probably what even what Jordan had. But I, I believe what separated him and, and other greats in the game is the competitiveness they, they play with. You know, Jordan believed every time he stepped on the floor that he was the best player on the floor and he was going to make sure that he proved that he was the best player on the, on the court. And, you know, he would go out there and, and try and, you know, actively humiliate the defenders who guarded him um, to show that he was the supreme player on the court. So. I think that supreme competitiveness and if there's, you know, as, as I got older and realized though, that there's no way I could compare to Michael Jordan with how he played. One thing I tried to emulate was the way he competed every time he was on the floor. And, you know, things that inspired me in his videos was, you know, his talking about how hard he worked and how hard and, and how hard he competed. And for me, you know, today's NBA, you know, 82 games in the NBA, guys just don't compete at that level every game. They kind of cruise through the regular season and then when they need to win a game, they turn it up and in playoffs, it turns into proper basketball. So, whereas I believe in the Jordan era, you know, every game was like, you know, there was, there were guys wanting willing to fight to win. And that was mm. how it the NBA was. And, and again, the rules were probably, you know, set out that you could literally physically fight to win a game. <laughs> yeah. It was brutal. Yeah. Like a war every five minutes. <laughs> Absolutely. Especially watching some of those old Knicks battles with, with old Spike and yelling on the sideline and the Pistons as well. The Pistons would just take it to the extreme when they elbowed punches and the lot. You so, got your money's worth when you were fouling in those days. <laughs> wouldn't it be, I'd love to go back and watch those, which uh, leads me to the, the next thing here, Dylan. Um, have you ever had a chance to watch him play live? I haven't, but I'll tell you a story. So, um, the good story too. So, um, my family, I was 13 years old, I think I was, um, and my family, uh, mum and dad told us kids we were going on a trip to America. And one of the things they said is we're going to visit a friend in Chicago and, and he has season tickets to the, to the Chicago Bulls and we're going to be able to watch Michael Jordan play. So we started the trip. We started off and we um, flew into LA and then we flew across to Miami. And when we we're in Miami, we actually got held up at gunpoint um, at a gas station. I uh, mean, robbed and take, they took everything. Um, we basically were left with singlet shorts and jandals. And uh, my mum luckily grabbed one bag that had one credit card in it, but we lost passports. We lost everything. And again, in those days, it was um, no internet. So you couldn't just, you know, and, and no, um, everything was, there was no phones as far as mobile phones. So you, nothing was saved. No phone numbers were saved in your phone. So Funnily enough, the address book that had the people's contact details in that we were going to visit in Chicago was in the black book and, and there was no way to contact them. And the game we were going to, because we'd got held up at gunpoint, we couldn't get out of Miami until we'd got new passports and, and insurance and all the rest of it. So here we are stuck in Miami in just singlet shorts and jandals, stranded with no rental car on the side of a gas station waiting for the police to arrive. And, um, and then the, the unfortunate thing was we didn't, we weren't able to get to see the, get to Chicago and watch Michael Jordan play, but we found out later that this guy's, this guy had got us courtside seats. So we were going to be sitting courtside at the, <laughs> watch Michael Jordan play. So you can imagine me and my two older brothers, whose idol was Jordan, you know, being able to get to watch this guy play was um, our dream. And this dream was completely shattered. Ewing. Ewing. Oh. That's a, that's a yard. 
I'm lost for words. I don't even know. I guess um, my first thought is like, I guess you, you just hate Florida now. I mean, you know, screw the heat and screw the magic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I tell you what, I've been back to Miami since, and I, and it makes you very wary. Um, I, I believe, still believe to this day, we were set up. It was again in the days where you didn't pre-book anything. We arrived at the airport, and all the rental cars were uh, were sold out pretty much. And the guy saw us on the. Remember, he used to go to the telephones and push buttons and ring the car companies looking for cars. And a guy came up to my dad and said, "Oh, are you looking for a rental car?" My dad said, "Yeah." And he goes, oh, "I've just had one return back to us, but everything else is sold out." So. He said the only downside is it's um it's got no fuel in it, but just bring it back empty. So we kind of did the did the deal, booked the rental car, and he said there's a gas station just down there on the corner, so just uh, fill it up, um, and then you know then just bring it back on empty. Um, and so we just thought nothing of it, loaded up with bags in the back seat of a car, you know, like looking like tourists, like you could ever look like one. And sure enough, bam, um, we pulled into the gas station, and um, two guys rolled up, putting the gun um, into and so as my dad went into pay and the prepay, um, they put a gun to my mum's head in the front seat of the car and one of the back to us kids and told us to get out. And yeah, pretty scary moment. Just jumped in the car and took off and took everything with us. And luckily, Far out. I grabbed a handbag that had a credit card in it. And that was what we survived on until the insurance and, and passports were sorted. How old were you when that happened? I think I was 13. Far out. You're definitely old enough to sort of be, remember it and be sort of traumatized by it, right? That isn't I it. kind of, I can kind of, um, again, I can't fully picture um, the guys, but I can picture the moment. And I actually froze because I was in the middle being the youngest. I was in the middle of the back seat and my brother's gone out either side and I kind of froze. And the guy actually physically reached in and grabbed me and like ripped me out of the car because I couldn't move. Like I was literally frozen. Here you run, you always think, what are you going to do in a situation where someone puts a gun to you? And you always think you're going to, swipe the gun out of his hand or you're going to do something brave and no there was none of that although my brother after they did it he said oh i should have just grabbed the gun he was about he was about 17 at the time <laughs> like, oh, i was gonna do this i was gonna do that and we we're like you ain't gonna do anything <laughs> Old, older brothers right absolutely uh, <laughs> uh, the end of corner one classic uh, good great yarn dylan jeepers <laughs> I feel for you. I, I'd be never going back to America after that. Uh, yeah, I, I think I'd do the same. Yeah. Quarter two, let's crack into it. I'll start us off with some stats before we rock into this. A six-time NBA champion, five-time NBA Finals MVP, six-time Finals MVP, 1985 Rookie of the Year, and don't forget the shoes I'm from 1985 because that's a, a whole point to itself. 14 times All-Star team, 11 times All-NBA team, 9 times All-Defensive team, 10 times scoring leader. Oh, I've got to have another big breath. <laughs> times steals leader. 50-plus point games, 31 of them. And then two Olympic golds. Holy pepperoni, that is a resume. And that's not even including never been to Game 7 in the NBA Finals. It's one of my favorite stats with it. Very impressive. Which leads me into the first question. Dylan, what do you think makes the three peaks so 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 special? He did, you know, obviously two separate three peaks with the with the, that that two year gap. Coming off a three peak yourself with the uh with the mighty New Zealand breakers. Uh what do you think uh yeah about his run there? Yeah, I think I think what makes three peaks pretty special is you you never like every time you have a championship season, very rarely you can bring the whole squad back. And the reason being is generally when you have a championship season, everyone's value goes up in that team. So you become mm -hmm. more valuable to other teams because everyone wants to have championship caliber players. And so NBA is no different. So when, you know, guys would have been out of contract at the end of that season and you literally can't keep everyone, especially under salary caps and things like that. So there's always players that fall by the wayside. So you, and you never know how guys are going to bounce back after a, after a championship season. Some come back better, some come back worse. So it's hard going back to back. Three Peters even harder because the target is fully on your back. Once you win it twice, everyone is doing everything they can and setting and building their teams to beat your team. Um, so that's generally what happens is they look at the, when you've won a championship, everyone normally bought builds the next year to beat that team. And then when you've been back to back, everyone's really loading up to go, how do we beat this team? And so you've, you've, everyone's bringing their best performance to this. So, so winning a three-peat um, is, 
is crazy. I mean, it's really hard to do. And the, the reality is you're doing it. And again, I would love to see the rosters to see how different the rosters were. Obviously their core players were the same and everyone always focused on them, but you've got to be able to get there and you're always going to rely on your, your role players to be able to get you there as well. So they would have had just different, different role players at different times. So really, really tough to do. So, I mean, that that's how special, um, obviously Jordan was, but also had the balls where they had some great complimentary role players as well. And with that, then, speaking of like a three peat, how hard would it be to go to a four peat? Like, how high, high is the drop off if you, if you keep your core together? Is it you got to g yourself up for to go again? Absolutely, well, it's very rare, um, and this this is a crazy one that that I'll say. It's very rare for a player to or players to stay at the top of their game for four straight years. Like, it's you're always gonna in a sport where. Especially in the NBA, where they're playing 82 games, you've got injuries, you've got wear and tear, you've got, you know, age. So, you know, and very rarely you have all the guys in their prime at the same time. So um, to go four years in a row winning, winning or more winning championships is phenomenal. And again, it's just, I mean, that's a credit to the organization that they are picking up, um, you know, doing a great job in the offseason, picking up talent and finding people in their prime. Because that's the, that's a GM's job is to find the talent in their prime. And then, you know, a lot of the, success of the Chicago Bulls. Yes, it was Michael Jordan and yes, it was Phil Jackson, but also, you know, the GM, um, whoever the GMs were at the time, putting these rosters together is, is, is half the battle. Yeah, well, poor old Jerry Krause, which I'm, I'm pretty sure he was the, the GM throughout. He, um, well, a lot of people don't realize the thing that was probably made famous in the last dance was he was the, you know, the Monstars, you know, manager, wasn't he? Yeah. Cause Jordan had this sort of disdain for him, but you know, and then of course he's just he's just been hung in the rafters, uh, or at least his. You know, I'm not even sure what you'd what you'd call it. His his sort of body. <laughs> yeah, what that's gonna say. But yeah, all of the all of the fans um, booed his wife that was accepting the award on his behalf, which is, you know, I think uh, whether or not the the last dance played a role in that, I'm not entirely sure. But I mean, as you alluded, I mean, he did a, a like a wonderful job. Um, if you look at the two different rosters the thing I, I i quite like is the first roster the first three peat you've got john paxton the three-point sniper then the second three peat you got steve kerr so i love how they've kind of similarly structured you know obviously with with rodman and pippen and that sort of going throughout do, do you think the fact following on from that four peat because i don't think anyone's really ever done it other than i guess the celtics back you know in the 60s 50s and 60s do you think the fact he went away for two years whether or not he sort of refreshed his body, whether or not it gave the Bulls an organization a chance to do a roster refresh. Do you think that was the reason they were able to go into a second three-peat? A lot of people sort of say, oh, if he didn't retire, they could have won eight in a row. And you kind of like, you're like, well, if you look how gassed they were at the end of the second three-peat, yeah, probably not at all. Yeah, it's pretty tough on the body to just keep going. And especially the, the length of NBA seasons is something, something's going to break eventually. So I think he needed a break, both physically and mentally. Uh, I mean, I think that he also brought his hunger back to compete again. You know, I think you always know when you are a player, if you're starting to go through the emotions and you're kind of, it becomes just a job and you've lost the passion for competing, that's probably when it's time to hang them up. And I'd probably think that for him, that was probably what it was. He probably lost that passion and desire to compete. And it was probably an element again, because he, he I think in the last dance, I'd say that's exactly why Jerry Cross was booed because the last dance really portrayed him as the villain. But the reality is the rosters he put together, even, you know, Phil Jackson taking the punt on trying to control Dennis Rodman. You can imagine <laughs> that would go for a season. You know, we've seen in recent times, your James Harden's of the world and, you know, they're hard to control these personalities and you get all these egos in one room. It's trying to control them. And I think that's, you know, that's a pretty tough thing to do. So, um, yeah, I believe that the break has probably just refreshed everyone and, um, and allowed other guys to be able to grow in their own individual roles so that when they all came back together, um, they were able to put together another dynamic team. With that, they're going through those like double championship runs coming towards the end. Who do you think there was like Michael Jordan's toughest opponent during those championship runs? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think, People started, obviously, teams started scouting how to stop Jordan and, and they would throw double teams at him and stuff. And I, I, I truly don't believe anyone could stop him one-on-one. -on -one. Like, I don't. And then that's, 
you know, there's a lot of players like that in today's day and age, you know, they're almost impossible to stop one-on-one. Um, and guys have become so good that one-on-one, it used to be the best defenders would be able to shut down the best offensive players, but that's no longer the case. Offensive players are so talented now that defenders very rarely can shut them down. Um, and it's like, I think if they held Jordan to under 20 or something, that was a good night, you know, and then, and most people, if you're scoring around the 20 mark, that's a, that's a good night scoring. So. I believe um, teams would would you know I think the you know the bad boys the Pistons and the Knicks and you know they they tried beating them up and and physically you know and, uh, willing their um, their strength on them and even that still didn't slow them down so you know Jordan was a pretty tough customer. Who was your favourite matchup to watch Michael Jordan head to head with? Um, I used to like uh, <laughs> the John Starks era, so um, Starks would get up and in him and you know and then try and um outscore him down the other end and when Starks was in his prime he was pretty tough as well but um you know and, and the same with you know when he goes through the eras of you know hitting the game winners on on certain players and I just remember the game winner over Craig Elo was, was one of my favorite moments uh, hitting that shot so yeah I mean he again he was one of those players that just um you could play your best day on him and he'd still make a shot at the end of the shot clock Going back to your that defense comment, they had the hand checking going on back then, right? So they they brought that rule in subsequently that you couldn't have two two hands on the defender. So I mean, if he was going up against that as well as in that Knicks era with the Oak Charles Oakley, no one was no one was getting to the um, getting to the rim with um, with with him there. Uh, but yeah, no, that was um, that was that was awesome. Uh, quarter three, just we're up to quarter three, just like that. Darn timer. <laughs> Get us every time, Jimmy. Every time, mate. Every day. Every Keeps us honest. It does. It does. So moving into quarter three, we're going to go through uh, Michael Jordan and international superstar. What made him MJ? So I'll start us off. Phil, there we go. The old boom, boom. Um, what factors do you think played a role in Michael Jordan's worldwide popularity, Dylan? Yeah, I think the... The NBA, um, I think 100%, they used them as the poster child. And so I think, you know, they really marketed Michael Jordan and then brands jumped on it. And so, you know, started doing Wheaties commercials and, you know, obviously his own shoe brand, Nike, did a good job of promoting him. But they really used Michael Jordan as the superstar. And um, the more the NBA used him as the superstar, brands started linking to him. It was probably right in that era where people started using athletes for, for advertising, you know, before... Again, before there was social media and stuff, they started using them in TV ads and on Wheaties boxes and, you know, um, Nike uh, posters and, you know, cards, as you alluded to. So I think just again, I think it's just, it was the evolution of marketing and, and Jordan was the first one to really be marketed by the NBA, which then grew his popularity internationally. And then you add in, as you mentioned earlier, his Olympic campaigns where he was on the dream team and, and the best player on the dream team. So the whole world knew about Michael Jordan. Yeah, I remember that uh, that that dream team was at ninety two, uh, and was it Barcelona? That was that was absolutely incredible. I think John Stockton was the only player people didn't recognise. <laughs> I don't think that was quite a hard case. As far as the Jordan brand extending beyond the basketball court, what do you think about that? Like it's it's now to the point where it's just I guess part of pop culture and just regular fashion. Yeah, I think, I mean, whenever you've got a logo that's recognizable without having the words under it, it's, it shows you've cracked it. You know, like you look at McDonald's, Nike, you know, the, the list goes on of, of logos that you can see without a word underneath it. And the, the Jumpman logo is exactly that. You know, like I would say if you were probably did a survey around the world of how many people have the Jumpman logo tattooed on their body, it's, it'd be a lot. Um, you know, I know at least a handful of people that have a the Jumpman tattoo tattooed on their body. So. You know, it's a pretty unique symbol and it basically symbolizes basketball, even though the NBA symbol that you have on your jersey symbolizes the NBA, the Jumpman symbol is, is probably more recognizable than the NBA symbol, um, in my opinion. I mean, here it is on the front of my shirt here. So, you know, it's like that alone says, says to people that it's Michael Jordan's brand and the Jordan shoes is a, is a whole nother ball game. I, I saw a, um, something on social media the other day and it talked about, it showed in the years Jordan's earnings. And Jordan earns more now than he's ever earned in his whole life. And it's pure because of his brand, you know, like it, yeah. it more now as, as a non-basketball player, as a retired basketball player than he is just from literally because of his shoes um, and his brand. 
and he can thank his mum for that. That's right. She she hey, really hooked him up. So Dylan, did you know that while we're recording today and we didn't do this on purpose, it's Michael Jordan's birthday. Oh wow, didn't know that. No. I know. I was reading that this morning. I was just like, what? Sixty first, sixty one years young. Oh. So what Michael Jordan shoes do you have, mate? What do you have many Jordans? I do. I've got probably about seven pairs Jordans. Um, and they're all various ones. So again, um, because I'm on my older statesman, I like to wear um, Jordans to work. So I try to wear ones that are not too loud. And, um, you know, I've got a lot of black Jordans uh, that go with black jeans and things like that. So I'm not too, I'm not looking like a teenager going to work. Um, <laughs> More like a, just a basketball CE. Um, so yeah, I've got, I've got a lot. Um, I have to thank my son who's a shoe collector. Um, and it's a pity that I'm not in his bedroom and I could show you a lot of Jordans, but, um, he's, he's the one who hooks me up with a lot of my shoes. So I'm quite fortunate to have a son who's uh, plugged into the game, I guess you could say. So whenever a good deal comes up on some size US 13, he's always like, dad, you want to buy these? Or <laughs> these are, these are high in value. You should buy these. They're really cheap or. You know, or go into this raffle and you might win these shoes. And, you know, he's, I'm not sure if you guys are aware, but you, you go into raffles now to buy limited edition Jordans and not even limited edition, just Jordans alone. And cause they sell out before they even hit the, hit the stores. So whenever there's, um, you know, new, new Jordans coming out, he's always like into this raffle and, you know, I do as I'm told and I've won a few raffles. So oh, I've got a few pairs. Yeah. I've entered into a couple and I've lost. So, <laughs> or I haven't won the opportunity to buy. I always think it's quite a funny, um, I've, ex I've tried to explain it to a couple of people before. So they're like, so you won the raffle, but you didn't actually win anything. You just win the right to pay full price for something. Yep. That's how it works. <laughs> and you're talking $300 full price kind of. Yeah, but minimum really. Mm. And do you have a favorite pair of Jordan still in your, your go-tos? Um, uh, um, I'm a bit of a OG, so I like the, um, original, uh, the Jordan ones, um, uh, probably my most favorite, um, Jordan fours as well. I uh, like the fours, uh, but yeah, Jordan ones are generally the, uh, the ones I like, although it's interesting as I've got older, um, again, age creeps in all the time. I prefer the low cut ones now than the, than the high tops. Yeah, uh, I was going to uh, ask. Yeah, that, my, but my son is just like, he just shakes his head at me and he says, you got to go the high tops. Is, the ones are not are not valuable. Um, so, um, and again, when you're, when you're creeping nearly close to 50, then your, your low cuts are generally that age bracket, I think. But um, I still have a few high tops as well. I wonder if that's why I like low tops. With James and I, we had this discussion about our favorite basketball shoes and we, we touched on uh, Kobe's and MJ's and, um, but I'm not a big fan of the high top Jordans at all. And I'm wondering if it's just the old soul in me prefers, <laughs> prefers the low, the low cut. And I think you might've just confirmed it there a wee bit. <laughs> well, to be honest, um, Kobe's, uh, as far as basketball shoes go, Kobe's are better than Jordan's. I'll definitely say that, you know, that the Kobe's, um, and then still, I mean, the value of a Kobe basketball shoe now is phenomenal, but the Kobe's are definitely, and you, you look around the the world Kobe's are still the most popular basketball shoe over at Jordan. Jordan's are far superior as far as casual shoe goes, but, um, mm. on court, even though, you know, Jordan brands got Luca and Russell Westbrook and, and other players now, like it's still the, the Kobe's are still the most popular basketball shoe. Probably the last question from me probably touched on it, on it largely throughout the chat, but how do you think Michael Jordan, I guess, his his success or just, just in general has influenced the global landscape of basketball. It's people that know basketball that don't know basketball know who Michael Jordan is. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think I want to say most people in the world would know who Michael Jordan is. He'd, he'd still be one of the most popular names, but even not people won't even know what he looks like, but they'll know who Jordan is or know Jordan, the word Jordan, um, and not the country, the player. Um, <laughs> I'd say more people know Jordan, the player than Jordan, the country would find yeah. their assessment, but, um, yeah, his impact on the, on the global stage is, is phenomenal again, both from his, um, playing days, but also just his brand, the, the brand Jordan is just, um, you know, such a huge brand and, um, Nike are a marketing beast and they've done a great job marketing that Jordan brand. I, I asked my, my wife, who's not a sports person, you know, who Michael Jordan is and she's like, yes, I would, who, who he is, know what he looks like. And I think that, that was pretty cool to see. Absolutely. Oh man, quarter three <laughs> over and done just like that. Just like that. F1, sorry, Dylan Phils. 
So last quarter, uh, we're going to move into talking about the, the lasting impact of Michael Jordan. And so for you, we've, we've touched on it lightly and there, but the number 23, Philip. Yeah, number 23 is, I mean, you look at the impact of Michael Jordan's number and uh, still to this day, I mean, a lot of athletes wear 23 because of Jordan, not just basketball players. You look at the Shane Warns of old, you know, the David Beckhams, the LeBron James, you know, the list goes on how many people wear number 23 because they wanted to be like Mike. I mean, again, he influenced me at a young age and and how many guys at, at, um, in my era wore number 23 because of Michael Jordan. And it was the most popular number to get on a team because of him. And I think still to this day, um, you know, that number 23 is still synonymous with Jordan and anyone who wears it is probably going about wearing Michael Jordan's number. And I've got a uh, controversial question for you. Should it be retired across all baskets? Cool. That's a tough one. And it's tough to do, tough to impact. There is still another what, 98 numbers, I suppose. So you, you could do that. Um, should it be? Uh, um, I say no. I say it should be in the NBA, like across all of NBA, but not across all leagues in the world. I think the interesting thing in the NBA is you've got the likes of Pat Riley at the Heat who retired the number 23. So I thought that was interesting because obviously when James went there, after his Cavs tenure, he had to switch to his US Olympic number, number six, because Riley decided to retire it. So I guess if, if any team did decide to, to retire off their own back, they, um, they, they absolutely, absolutely can. But I mean, there, there have been quite a few players that have worn 23 um, since that probably deserve. I mean, LeBron James hasn't made it his own, but I know there's a younger generation of people that associate 23 with LeBron now. So it would be challenging. Yeah. Absolutely. Can, can you just delve into uh, some of the, I guess, specifics of MJ's game that a lasting impact on, on basketball? I mean, I guess you look at Kobe who always talked about, he, he modeled his game on, on MJ. Then now you've got Ann Edwards who just looks like a mirror image of, of MJ. Yeah. I think um, what made MJ special is, I mean, he obviously we talked about his athleticism and competitiveness, but. He could score as a, a multi-level scorer, so he could score at the rim. He could dunk on you. He could finish up underneath on reverse layups and draw the foul and install, you know, his hang time. There, there was a lot talked about his hang time back in the day, you know, it was above anyone's hang time. And again, he'd be able to make contact and still finish on layups. But probably his pull-up jump shot was probably his money shot. You know, he, yeah, he really started evolving into a three-point shooter later. And it'd be interesting, you know, like um, I was listening to Scotty Pippen on an interview yesterday and he was talking about how the whole basketball game has just been turned into shooters. It's just shooters. Uh, everyone's recruiting shooters now, not even scorers. It's just pure shooters that you put some guys who can facilitate and then shooters around them, they can just knock down shots. And Back in the back in the eighties and nineties in the NBA, it wasn't about three point shooting. It was about guys who could score, um, and then guys who could defend. And there wasn't there was very few multiple multiple that could do multiple. You know, like Jordan could defend and score, but he was very rare. Um, and again, even in today's day and age in the NBA, you've got scorers and then you've got set guys that are just defensive players that can just knock down shots. The old three and D. So I think what what made Jordan pretty special was he could score. Any level, he could score threes, he could hit pull-up jumpers, he could get all the way to the rim. Um, and again, he could defend at a, at a high clip, not only stay in front of his player, but block shots and steal the ball at a, at a high clip. Uh, you know, the stats that you read out earlier was phenomenal, you know, to think how many defensive player of the year um, that he won and then how many all defensive teams he'd won and leading the league in steals and scoring titles. It's just, I mean, to do that at a um, more than once is pretty special. Yeah, I've read an interesting trade that was going to happen back in the day, which I'll, I'll lead into this question. But when Tracy McGrady was about to get drafted, they offered Tracy McGrady for Scotty Pippen. Now, I was thinking, without Scotty, there's no MJ. Do you think that would do you think that would have worked? It was definitely Batman and Robin with uh, with Jordan and Pippen. I mean, and unfortunately for Pippen, he was the Robin, uh, but. I think Pippen in his own right had not had Jordan there. Would he have been as good as he is? Probably not. Um, he would have been a fantastic player, but in the same with Jordan, he wouldn't have been as good without Pippen there. There was the times where Pippen was outstanding in games and Tracy McGrady in his prime, definitely with Jordan would have been a tough, tough ask. Again, I think Pippen played a great role um, for Jordan, was happy to take a, 
a back seat at times and watch Jordan go to work. Yeah, because I think with with T Mac, he was he was a phenomenal scorer. So yeah, if you if you think about pairing them, that that, that would have been interesting. Uh, you know, whether or not this young buck coming through would have been happy to to cede some of that 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 control. And I I, I read the same interview. Jordan said if they if they put it through, he'd retire. So uh, that's hence why the trade didn't that didn't go ahead. Yeah, the, I think I think the Bulls saw sense on that one. What qualities of um, of Michael Jordan? I've kind of touched on it, but do you think make him the goat? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you know the goat conversation is a really tough one because the game has evolved so much compared to when um, the Jordan era. Jordan was a, ahead of his time. I mean, I guess where players have gone these days, um, you know, there's so much, so many more athletes running around, um, a higher skill set, um, purely just picking up a basketball at a younger age and, and training harder at a younger age. So the, the actual skill has gone up, but I think Jordan's the goat. I mean, you, you read the accolades out before, I mean, uh, and I've talked about his competitiveness. I think Jordan is the ultimate competitor. Um, you know, like I think. A lot of top players around the world, when you talk about what separates them, it's usually their competitiveness, they, how they compete. And, and Jordan wasn't always the, the nicest teammate because he demanded <laughs> excellent. You know, no. a lot about him and Kobe and guys like that. They, they, they were assholes at times, you know, like that they felt like they had to be. And, and, you know, when a lot of times when you are, um, at the top of the, the totem pole, you have to be an asshole sometimes to get the best out of people. And sometimes they push that too far. And sometimes they pushed guys over the edge, but they played the numbers game and figured that, you know, for every one that fell by the wayside, they would have five that would respond to it. So, you know, a lot of times when you talk back to people that have played with them, they're not always that complimentary of them personally. Um, they don't fault that they are the best in the world, but they do fault the way they went about their business a lot of times. And, um, you know, it's not easy being the best. Obviously, you have a target on your back, but also, you know, sometimes they demand excellence above what people are willing to give, um, and then therefore it becomes a problem within a team. Yeah, he must have made a ton of sacrifices, especially upstairs, because during the last starts, I don't know about about you two, I was worried about him thinking like, hell, if he's that punitive, he must have been like, like one snap away from either being a genius or being insane. And I think that was something there and watching that, like what, what were your thoughts on watching the last dance and watching MJ? Yeah, it's great, great flick. Um, great, great little documentary. Um, you're right though. I mean, these, these top athletes in every sport are on that cusp of that genius or crazy, you know, and I think very rare guys, guys come along with the skill set. And the drive and the work ethic and, and the IQ all put in one package and Jordan had it all. Um, and you see more and more guys like LeBron and Kobe, those guys all had it as well. Uh, but most guys have some, but don't have all those packages put together. And, but again, you talk about Jordan and some of the stories I've heard from guys who have either played with him or, or played against him. So he competes at everything. He'll be on the team bus and he'll be like. I guarantee you, we're going to see a red car before a white car. I'll bet you ten thousand dollars. You know, get <laughs> be on the line like that and lose, and just be happy to lose a bet. You know, but or not be happy to lose the bet, but then would go double or nothing next one. You know, like he's he just competed in everything that he did, whether it's golf, whether it's card playing, whether it's choosing the next color car, whether it's shooter shooting at, at training. You know, choosing the best shooter in the team and competing, going I'm a better shooter than you, and wanting to prove to everyone that he is the best and willing to put money on the line to prove it. And, you know, from my understanding, most times he won and when he didn't, he was not happy about it. So he was, I think to keep him alive, he needed, needs to compete. And he's probably struggling in his old age now because it's hard because we, how do you compete? From my understanding, he is a, is a big gambler as well, you know? So again, you've, you always, when you're a competitor, you always got to have competition, right? So when you get, when you retire from playing, you've still got to get that from somewhere. And, uh, you know, for me personally, that's why I still play social basketball because I still love competing and you can't get that in any other arena other than the sport for me, you know, playing board games with the family is not the competition where you want to <laughs> that competitive drive. Trust me. It's going to say, yeah, be your wife in your face. <laughs> like that. Dylan, awesome, mate. Thank you so much. What an episode. So wrapped to be talking Michael Jordan with an absolute legend. Love to have you back more and more. <laughs> uh, great to be here. And uh, obviously uh, you talk about Jordan and, you know, there's so many, 
so many things you can talk about. I mean, we just banged out what an hour just there, just easily talking about, you know, one of the OGs. For me, you know, being able to talk hoops about one of the greatest or the greatest is pretty cool.